Today I'm reading from C.G. Young Letters, Volume 2. I'm going to read from the letter to Bernhard Lang, dated June 1957. On page 375, he's talking about a discrepancy between the view of Martin Buber and himself. Mr. Lang asked him a question in a letter. The question was, do you, Jung, regard yourself as a believing person? And is your statement, quote, modern consciousness abhors belief, unquote, simply the legitimate descriptive statement of a scientist about the present state of consciousness? Or do you identify yourself personally with this attitude? Jung says, let us take as an example the believing person who has Buber's attitude to belief. He lives in the same world as me and appears to be a human being like me. But when I express doubts about the absolute validity of his statements, he expostulates that he is the happy possessor of a receiver, an organ by means of which he can know or tune in the transcendent. This information obliges me to reflect on myself and ask myself whether I also possess a like receiver which can make the transcendent, i.e. something that transcends consciousness and is by definition unknowable, knowable. But I find in myself nothing of the sort. I find I am incapable of knowing the infinite and eternal or paradoxical. It is beyond my powers. I may say that I know what is infinite and eternal. I may even assert that I have experienced it. But that one could actually know it is impossible because man is neither an infinite nor an eternal being. He can know only the part, but not the whole, not the infinite and eternal. So when the believer assures me that I do not possess the organ he possesses, he makes me aware of my humanity, of my limitation, which he allegedly does not have. He is the superior one, who regretfully points out my deformity or mutilation. This is what I reproach them with, that they exalt themselves above our human stature and our human limitation and won't admit to pluming themselves on a possession which distinguishes them from the ordinary mortal. I start with the confession of not knowing and not being able to know. Believers start with the assertion of knowing and being able to know. There is now only one truth, and when we ask the believers what this truth is, they give us a number of very different answers with regard to which the one sure thing is that each believer announces his own particular truth. Instead of saying, to me personally it seems so, he says, it is so, thus putting everybody else automatically in the wrong. Now in my estimation it would be more human, more decent, and altogether more appropriate if we carefully inquired beforehand what other people think, and if we expressed ourselves less categorically. It would be more becoming to do this than to believe subjective opinions and to damn the opinions of others as fallacies. If we do not do this, the inevitable consequence is that only my subjective opinion is valid. I alone possess the true receiver, and everyone else is deformed who lacks such an important organ as belief is considered to be. Buber is unconscious of the fact that when he says God, he is expressing his subjective belief and imagining by God something other people could not sanction. What, for instance, would a Buddhist say about Buber's conception of God? My human limitation does not permit me to assert that I know God. Hence, I cannot but regard all assertions about God as relative, because subjectively conditioned, and this out of a respect for my brothers, whose other conceptions and beliefs 
have as much to justify them as mine. If I am a psychologist, I shall try to take these differences seriously and to understand them. But under no circumstances shall I assume that if the other person doesn't state my opinion, it is due to a deformity or lack of an organ. How could I have any communication at all with a person if I approached him with the absolutist claim of the believer? Though I am sure of my subjective inner experience, I must impose on myself every conceivable restriction in interpreting it. I must guard against identifying with my subjective inner experience. I consider all such identifications as serious psychological mistakes indicative of total lack of criticism. For what purpose am I endowed with a modicum of intelligence if I do not apply it in these decisive matters. Instead of being delighted with the fact of my inner experience, I am then using it merely to exalt myself through my subjective belief above all those who do not accept my interpretation of the experience. The experience itself is not in question, only the absolutizing interpretation of it. If I have a vision of Christ, this is far from proving that it was Christ, as we know only too well from our psychiatric practice. I therefore treat all confessions of faith with extreme reserve. I am ready at any time to confess to the inner experience, but not to my metaphysical interpretation. Otherwise, I am implicitly laying claim to universal recognition. On the contrary, I must confess that I cannot interpret the inner experience in its metaphysical reality, since its essential core is of a transcendental nature and beyond my human grasp. Naturally, I am free to believe something about it, but that is my subjective prejudice, which I don't want to thrust on other people, nor can I ever prove that it is universally valid. As a matter of fact, we have every reason to suppose that it is not.